So last time I, I gave you a bunch of constructions, and probably over lunch you were like building modular categories. Um, but anyway, so now what, what, what should we do with them? So one question is we should try to classify them. And um, one sort of um, initial way um, to think about classifying them is to try to address kind of this, there's, there's an old question that um, goes back to um, uh, like even in the conformal, or, um, conformal field theory days is do all modular categories come from quantum groups in some sense? So that would be like an interesting classification, right? So, um, and there was sort of a bit of debate about this and um, so um, what I'll present now is kind of a, a, a way of thinking about that question um, that, uh, that avoids um, counterexamples that we know of. So, um, so in this paper by, um, by Davidov, Muger, Nikchik, and Ostrich, and then there's a follow-up paper, they define something called the Witt group. And the point of this is that modular categories form an abelian group. Um, and so the first thing to do is it's actually um, equivalence classes of modular categories. So the equivalence relation here is take two modular categories. Um, we say that they are equivalent, um, Witt equivalent, if there is a fusion category A, so that when we form this uh, Deline product of C with the reverse braided D, that uh, you get a double, a double of A. Okay. So, uh, and so in, this is an equivalence relation on modular categories. And maybe the correct thing to say is that this is uh, an equivalence relation on non-degenerate braided fusion categories because you don't have to include the spherical structure in this story. It's, it's not important. Um, it sometimes plays an interesting role, but for this definition you don't need it because that's like a choice of something. Because indeed A itself, right, mm, might not be spherical. It could be just a fusion category. And then its Drenfeld center is a non-degenerate braided fusion category and so that's kind of the idea. So that's, that's just the elements of this abelian group. So how is the, uh, what are the operations? Well, uh, it turns out that the product um, in this group is just essentially Deline product, just the ordinary Deline product. Um, and, one, and so the fact that two makes sense is a theorem, of course. Right, that the, if you take um, kind of the equivalence class of, um, uh, right, that, th that this doesn't depend on representative. That's kind of the idea. Um, and the identity in this group is the class of all Drenfeld centers of fusion categories. So, for example, uh, VEC itself is a perfectly good representative, but so is every Drenfeld center of a fusion category. So that's like a huge collection of modular categories. And then it should be clear from the sort of how the equivalence and the multiplication are defined that the inverse class is simply take the class of the reversed braided, take the, reverse the braiding on your class. That gives you the inverse. And that follows, if you remember uh, here, this example here, so if C is modular, its Drenfeld center, right, is uh, the Deline product of what you started with and the reverse. So that shows how the re inverse clearly works from this. It's just this fact. Okay. Right. Okay. So this is a, a group. And so um, nice things about it. So it's called the Witt group. Um, and there's a classical version of Witt group. Um, it comes from, um, well, quadratic forms on uh, abelian groups. There's already a theory of this that's classical. That's contained in here um, because we have metric groups. Metric groups are modular categories, give us modular categories, and so that, that theory fits right into this. It's an extension of that. So um, what can we say about the Witt group? Well, it's abelian has infinite rank. Um, the torsion subgroup is infinite. Um, 
but it has exponent 32. What that means is take any element of finite order, its order is uh, a divisor of 32. Okay? Moreover, there is an element, uh, there is a modular category whose wit class has order 32. In fact, there's infinitely many of those of order 32, infinitely many wit inequivalent. They're even wit inequivalent modulo the subgroup uh, uh, generated by pointed categories. So there's really infinite in this way. Um, and so anyway, there's lots of interesting questions about this, this group, the structure of this group. Um, and it's, it's being explored. Um, a few nice things about it is that boson condensation preserves wit class, the way I've described it. Um, and algebra condensation does as well. Okay, so the, the much more general setting. And of course, um, so in other words, local A module categories. That's sort of the way I described it. Gauging also preserves wit class. And so it's, it's a nice way to think of all. Whoops. I'm going to have this. You're going to give me this struggle too? All right. Let's see, Let's see if it does it again. And then. What's wrong for me is that I just connect to the addition. Okay, okay. I'll try that. And then I'll talk for a bit. Okay, right. So there's going to be a, a conjecture. And that is so when people were looking for what we call exotic modular categories, so categories that sort of don't come from quantum groups in some way. The, the first examples were doubles of things coming from subfactor theory. So the double part, uh, the double of the even part of the hogger up subfactor. Um, there was lots of, so I myself uh, wrote a paper with co-authors explaining why this was exotic in some ways, right? You can't get it from certain processes starting from quantum groups. Um, but this sort of sweeps all of that kind of uh, counterexample away by saying, well, anything that is a center is, is trivial in this group. And so you can ask the following question. Take all the quantum group categories. Okay? Take any Lie algebra and any integer L, form this modular category from this. Take all of those. Do these generate the Witt group? In other words, do the classes of these generate the wit group? And this is uh, an open conjecture. And of course, if they do, then it would kind of give a way in which it's a positive answer that indeed all modular categories come from quantum groups because they're, well, every wit class sort of contains a quantum group category. And so all you have to do, yeah, not no big deal, just take all quantum group categories and um, right, do all gaugings that we don't necessarily know how to do yet of, uh, right, by symmetries of some uh, algebra objects and so forth. Okay, so, yeah. So it's a conjecture that. Ah, well, that preserve the wit class. So, um, yeah, as far as I know, I mean, maybe, maybe there would be other things. Things, but in terms of the constructions that I've been talking about, yeah, this, this is pretty much it. Right, so that's to sort of understand the torsion part of this group. So there's, of course, a big infinite part, like Fibonacci, for example, has infinite order in the Witt group. Okay. Uh, um, uh, question? That's right. So easing has order 16. Yeah, any of the eight easings has order 16. The element of order 32 is a square root of easing. Uh, so if you take, um, right, so we, we wrote a paper where we, so this it was known that this was true, but that there's infinitely many. It's kind of a recent result. Um, so these are um, SON level N, uh, where N is odd. 
So these are all, all square roots. Yeah, uh, SO3 level 2. So there's no, uh, yeah, it is, a square root of an easing is in particular non weakly integral. Yeah, that's for, yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, yeah. What comes to the square root of easing? In the width group, right? It squares to easing. Yeah. So, so yeah, and you can also like you can ask this kind of question for lots of things. In fact, the trivial category, I mean, the trivial wit class also has infinitely many square roots, uh, which is kind of you know surprising. We expect two, yeah, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, and those are S O N. Those some are S O N level N, where N is even, uh, or something related to that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's a fascinating group. Um, The rank of what? Uh, it's also infinite. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing's infinite rank, and there's two. Yeah. The torsion part's infinite rank. The other part's infinite rank. What is the square root of eating higher than so Well, eh, the converse is true. I guess we don't know if there are others out there somewhere. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, so this is one way of kind of approaching classification. Um, and uh, yeah, when I first saw this, I, I felt it was cheating. But now I'm very happy with it. I like it a lot. Um, okay, so the next thing to think about, which I've been thinking about um, since the, you know, the day I walked into Zheng Han Wang's office as his postdoc, um, is classification by rank of modular categories. So let's, let's see how this works. So there's a few results that we can immediately employ. So one is this Okneanu rigidity, which says that for a fixed collection of fusion rules, there's at most finitely many braided fusion categories with those fusion rules. And by at most, I mean it could be zero, which I guess is a finite number for mathematicians. But sometimes physicists think of zero as not. I don't know. It's, it's a confusing thing to me, but anyway, just to be careful. Right, so that means that if we can just classify all the fusion rule algebras, we're in business, right? That would be, I mean, up to finite ambiguity. So, um, right. Moreover, if you have a braided fusion category, it will have only finitely many spherical structures. That's easy to see. So, in fact, uh, um, in answer to your question, Zheng Han, this was... Um, something that Dimitri said, that there's kind of uh, pivotal structures or spherical structure and one-to-one -one correspondence with the, um, the, the two subgroup of the universal um, grading group. So that's something we can just deal with. So there's finitely many. Moreover, the Verlinde formula says that just if you have your S matrix, you can determine all of the fusion rules. Okay? So the upshot of this is that, well, you get really close to a classification if you can just classify all modular data. Remember, modular data is just the S and the T matrix. Okay, so now um, you can't see here, but uh, okay. So here I have, uh, I just clipped from one of our papers, a massive list of constraints on S and T for a modular category. So if T, so if C is a modular category, then the S and T matrices satisfy lots of things. Um, so T is a diagonal matrix. Um, the, uh, we have these, um, these sort of Gauss sum things that play a role. Um, I, I won't necessarily go through all of these, but for example, this one right here is the statement that uh, um, S and T give a projective representation of the modular group SL2Z. Um, there's some fun uh, field theory, Galois theory involved. So there's, you can, um, it turns out that all of the entries of the S matrix live in the same field generated by the entries of the T matrix, which is just a cyclotomic field, right? The, 
the um, twists are always roots of unity. And so if you just take Q, rationals adjoin, you know, the entries of the T matrix, you've got yourself a cyclotomic extension, which is a relief to anybody who's studied Galois theory, right? Um, because in particular, you're never going to have to deal with non-solvable polynomials. Everything is solvable here. Um, and, right, and then the entries of the S matrix are, uh, live inside that same field, so you have a field extension. And in fact, both of those extensions are Galois extensions, uh, meaning that the, the, right, the Galois group, if you look at what it fixes, it only fixes the rationals. So that's helpful. Um, so here we have, this is the Verlinda formula. Um, we have something called the balancing equation, which comes from the fact that, it had, that this is ribbon category. Um, we have these Frobenius sure indicators. We have formulas for them in terms of the other data right here. Okay, so that's the nth uh, Frobenius sure indicator. And the second one is the most interesting one uh, so far. So it's zero if something is non self dual, and it's plus or minus one if it's self dual. Um, and of course, it's not hard to see that it lives in Q adjoin this root of unity, but it's actually in Z adjoin this. So that's a big deal because in number theory, algebraic number theory, we're looking for things that are integers in some field. Um, and so we can, we can really use number theory and not just field theory. So that's useful. A um, few other things. So if I look at the fields generated by the uh, entries of the S matrix and the T matrix, then um, we can look at their relative Galois groups. So the automorphism groups of these fields that fix the rationals or fix some subfield. And so in fact, so this is an abelian group, okay, because it lives inside a cyclotomic field. So all of the Galois groups will be uh, quotients of some abelian group. And moreover, it's an abelian subgroup of symmetric group on R letters, where R is the number of simple objects, or the number of isomorphism classes of simple objects. So not only do we have sort of a symmetric group way of thinking of these things, it's abelian. So you can just think, okay, I'm just going to write down all of the abelian subgroups of S5. Uh, and you can certainly do it, and it's useful. Um, the relative Galois group, so this is the, so the, the automorphisms of the cyclotomic field FT that fix the entries of the S matrix is uh, an elementary abelian two group. So it's just Z mod two to some power. So it's a really simple kind of group. Um, and then the theorem that we proved um, that turned out to be kind of, um, uh, groundbreaking is what we call the Cauchy theorem. And it says the following. If you look at the prime divisors of the dimension of the category and the prime divisors of the order of the T matrix, they coincide. And now you have to be, so one way to say this properly, you have to think about Dedekind domains and what does it mean to have a, be a prime divisor? Well, it's an ideal. And so, but there's an easier way to describe this. Basically what you do is you take your dimension. Your dimension is some algebraic integer, okay? You take its product with all of its Galois conjugates, okay? There's finitely many of them because it's a finite extension. You just take that product. The result will be an integer, an ordinary integer. You take the prime factors of this integer. Now it's just ordinary prime factors. Those primes are exactly the same set of primes as the prime factors of the integer in the order of the T matrix. Okay. So this is quite powerful. Okay. This, this gives you, this says, well, number theory is, um, is ready to be applied. OK, so um, let me pause here and see if there are any questions. Now, you might ask, 
does this list of seven things characterize modular data? And I, I think the answer is no. Um, there's, you know, probably something, but uh, to be honest, I couldn't tell you a counterexample at the moment. Um, and indeed, you know, it, it, it's more like I think it's no because I'm pessimistic about, you know, that this list is complete. I really don't know. Okay. okay. So now we can, we have sort of a lot of things to use if we want to try to classify. So now we have a lot of tools uh, at our disposal. So, like I said, the first thing we can certainly use is Galois theory, because all of the entries of the SMT matrix live in Galois extensions, and we can talk about the Galois, uh, the Galois group, and um, and use this information, and we'll see how to do that. Um, the Verlinda formula is equivalent to the statement that the Fusion matrices are simultaneously diagonalized by the S matrix. Okay, so that's really nice, um, right? So now we can use linear algebra or matrix analysis um, to study these things. Um, something that we've been using recently that's extremely useful is the following fact. So the reason this is called a modular category is because you get a representation of what's called the modular group, SL2Z. And you can think about, so that's sort of what number theorists call it, the modular group, because it's related to modular forms. Um, but um, maybe for topologists, another way of thinking of this, and maybe even a better way, is to think of SL2Z as the mapping class group of the torus. Okay? So in fact, from a modular category, you will get projective representations of um, the mapping class group of any uh, compact genus G surface with punctures. Okay? So that's like a lot of stuff. So uh, let me kind of break it down a little bit. So like the disk with punctures, that's the mapping class group of that, is the braid group. Okay? And we all know we get a representation of the braid group from uh, modular categories. Um, even though maybe uh, nobody said it today, but now I have. Okay, so that's that's one case. Of course, the torus is this SL2Z representation, and more generally, you can you can get a representation of you know a genus seven surface with 50 punctures. Okay. However, you have to keep in mind it's a projective representation. What this means is that it isn't it isn't kind of on the nose. It's sort of a representation where there's some scale factors that you can kind of ignore, a projective factor. Um, and you don't want to ignore them, in fact, and, and, but maybe at a first approximation it's okay. But so they actually play an important role. Okay, so now what's so interesting about this? So SL2Z is, of course, kind of a nasty group. Um, it's infinite um, and um, uh, but discrete, uh, right? So it's, it's not, it's sort of this bad place, right? So finite groups are nice, compact groups are nice, SL2Z is neither, right? Um, it's kind of in this middle range. But fortunately, when we look at this representation, so we have this projective representation of SL2Z. Now generators for SL2Z is this little s matrix and this little t matrix. Um, of course, very famous in conformal field theory. These are very, very important. Um, Right, so when we look at this representation, it turns out that it isn't so bad after all. This representation factors over SL2 uh, Z mod N, where N is the order of the T matrix. So this is a, a theorem of uh, Ng and Schauenberg. So this is Ng Schauenberg result. Um, what does that mean, factoring over? It just means that there is a, um, you can kind of, take a mid-step. So you start from SL2Z to matrices, and you could pass through SL2Z mod N, and then go along, and it's this, this diagram commutes. That's what it means to factor over. So in particular, the image of this representation 
is the image of a representation of SL2 Z mod N, which is a finite group. Okay, SL2 Z mod N um, is, well, it's the group of two by two matrices with entries in this ring Z mod N that have determinant one. Okay, okay so that's a finite group. So now that's, that's also quite useful. And moreover, you can, um, if you choose to, turn this representation uh, of uh, SL2Z, its projective, into an honest representation, a linear representation. And the way to do that is you just have to renormalize your S and T. So let me go back to the previous page briefly and point out where this happens. So notice here, uh, right, we have this. The defining relations for SL2Z is ST cubed equals S squared. And moreover, S to the fourth is the identity. That's it. That's all you need. So as an abstract group, it's just that presentation. Two generators, S and T. ST cubed is equal to S squared. And S to the fourth is the identity. That's all you need. Um, so notice here this P plus is slightly annoying. Um, it could happen that this P plus vanishes, or rather is one. So anomaly free maybe is what it's called. Um, and, but generally you have to do something. And the other thing to notice is if I take, so you can't exactly see it, if I take S squared or something like S squared, you don't get, uh, um, yeah, so if you put all these things together, you'll see that S to the fourth is some multiple of the identity, not the identity itself. So you have to divide by the square root of the dimension to fix that. Anyway, you do this, and um, the nice thing is that you can do it. The bad thing is that there are 12 ways to do it. Um, so you kind of have to pick one, and maybe you, know, you have to decide. But fortunately, they're all roughly the same. They're basically the same thing up to some character, just some scale multiple. So, right. So anyway, you can do that. And so you get this proper representation that I will call rho. And we'll see how, that, how useful that is. And then finally, we can use lots of algebraic number theory, which I think of as sort of being the study of these dedicant, this dedicant domain of integers, uh, cyclotomic integers. Look at things in this way. Okay. So, any questions? So, probably talking too fast to keep you awake, but then that's also not good. Okay. So, um, now, right. Um, if you're an algebraist, um, you're really happy uh, because you have work for the next few years. Okay? Um, so let's, let's look a little bit more carefully and sort of try to put some of these things together to see how we can you know, really get down to classifying things. So let's let G be the Galois group of the S matrix. Okay? So again, this Galois group is a abelian group, and it's a subgroup of SR, the symmetric group on R letters, where R is the number of simple objects in this category. So, um, right, so we write down this S matrix here, um, and this is how it looks. So the first, so it, first of all, S is a symmetric matrix in the sense that it's its own transpose. It may have complex entries, but um, it's its own transpose. And so it looks like this. And the first row, and of course then also the first column, consist of the categorical dimensions of the simple objects. Right? Um, it's just a choice of ordering of our things that make it that way. And um, if you um, conjugate the fusion matrix Ni by this S, it diagonalizes it, but it diagonalizes it in a really nice way. So it diagonalizes it so that the entries down the diagonal are actually kind of appear in the S matrix itself. 
It's not maybe super surprising because, right, ni is an integer matrix, so where are the entries going to really come from? They're going to come from s. And, um, right, this s squared is somehow, right, um, well, s to the fourth is the identity. Anyway, you can kind of see that it's not super surprising, but here's what the entries look like. So if I conjugate in i by s, I get the dimension here first, and then I get all of these other eigenvalues, where um, the eigenvalue, so it's s i j over d j. So what does that mean? So the idea is, if I, if I want to know the eigenvalues of uh, in i, all I have to do is start with the S matrix, divide each column by the top entry. Okay? So I'll get a matrix with ones across the top, which are the eigenvalues of the identity matrix, which is the fusion matrix for the unit object. Okay? So yeah, that works so far. Um, but then the rest of them are all just lying there for you to play with. Okay? So in particular, um, Right, uh, these are exactly the eigenvalues of ni. And now, something nice about eigenvalues of integer matrices is that they are algebraic integers. Okay, so maybe maybe you know this and maybe you don't. But so there's an algebraic number. So an algebraic number is the solution to a polynomial with integer coefficients. An algebraic integer is a solution to a polynomial with integer coefficients and that's monic. Okay, so the leading coefficient has to be one. So um, that's that's the difference here. And these are actually algebraic integers. So that's useful. And um, moreover, we can now apply our an element of the Galois group to these entries, and something amazing happens. When you do this, of course, you're going to get another eigenvalue. You can just stop and think about that. Yeah, Galois conjugate of an eigenvalue would better be an eigenvalue because n is an integer matrix. Um, but it turns out that it does this uniformly. Okay, so it, this when I apply sigma to this eigenvalue of n i, so that's the i here, I get another eigenvalue of n i. And so there's some you know, j prime, since that's what the eigenvalues are. But this is independent of i. So if I replace i by k, exactly the same j and j prime appear. It only depends on sigma. Okay? So the columns of this S matrix divided by its top row are permuted. Okay? The entries aren't sort of scrambled around in some willy-nilly way. They're permuted. And that's, in fact, how you prove um, how, um, I think it was um, de Bory and Gore or something like that that proved this. That's exactly how you prove that this Galois group is a subgroup of the symmetric group because of this permutation of columns. Okay. Right, so that's what you get. So you get this permutation of columns. And so, of course, it's good to have different names for them. So the actual elements of the Galois group I'll call sigma. And if I put a hat on it, it means it's the version that permutes columns. Okay? So, that that's, so it's, it's the image under this map. Okay? So just to kind of distinguish them. And then if you play around with the um, S and T matrix, uh, um, the, the relations they satisfy, then what you'll find is that you have a really beautiful symmetry of the entries of the S matrix that I've boxed in green here. So Sij is up to a sign S uh, sigma hat of I sigma hat inverse of J. Okay? And you kind of get this by applying sigma composed with sigma inverse to Sij and then using kind of the the result. Um, but yeah, so this is really nice. So what this says is that if you have a big Galois group, okay, then the um, kind of the degrees of freedom in the S matrix are really reduced, right, because you have all of these entries being essentially equal up to a sign. And the signs have some significance and we can kind of control them and understand them, but just for now I'm going to leave that 
off. OK, any, any questions so far? OK, so now um, we can conclude this, that the SIJ actually live in a cyclotomic field. We have this abelian subgroup. And so let's see how we might use this to classify, see if we can just use that. OK, so let's take a very specific example. Let's take rank 3. So in rank 3, so now we're looking at abelian subgroups of S3. All right, there's not really so many. So let's, um, and so I will, um, I will label my, so I'm labeling my objects by 0, 1, 2 in this case. So let's suppose that the Galois group is this abelian subgroup generated by the transposition 1, 2, okay, as you know, it's isomorphic to this, as the subgroup of, uh, of S3, okay? So the first thing to notice is that well, what does it do to the columns of S when you've normalized them in this way, divide by the top? Well, it fixes the first column, okay? Now, this is a Galois extension. So if you have a Galois extension, the fixed field consists of rational numbers, okay? But the quantum dimensions or the dimension, the categorical dimensions are algebraic integers. So an algebraic integer that is also rational is an ordinary integer. So that just from this assumption that this is our Galois group, we immediately say, OK, this category is integral. All of the dimensions of simple objects are integers. OK? And then you can use the actual symmetry here um, to apply it to D1, so this dimension 1. So this is the S01 entry, maybe. And so when you apply. Right, so it's equal to, up to a sign, this entry. And we know exactly what sigma hat does. It fixes 0 and it sends 1 to 2. And so we get that the, the dimension 1 of the first object or first non-trivial object is equal to, up to a sign, the dimension of the second one. Okay. Now, um, I can write down what the dimension of the category is. It's 1 plus twice d1 squared. And now here's something that maybe it, it's a challenging exercise, but it's not too hard to show. And that is that in a modular category, take the dimension of any simple object, square it, that will divide the dimension of the category itself. Okay? I claim you can prove that simply by thinking about what I said here about the eigenvalues of NI, uh, of NI being obtained from taking the S matrix and dividing by the top column. The length of a column, the length of the first column, of course, is uh, uh, the length squared of the first column is, of course, the dimension of the category. And when you divide through, you get a bunch of things that are algebraic integers. And if you apply these two facts, you will find that the dimension of the category is divisible by the square of the dimension of any ob simple object in a modular category. Okay? What that means by divides, it means that the ratio is an algebraic integer. Right? Just like divides usually means the ratio is an integer. It's algebraic integer. Okay? So what that says is that, first of all, I know that everything is an integer now, so I'm in business. And so I know that if I take this equation here and divide through by d1 squared, I'll get an integer equals 1 over d1 squared plus 2. And so that tells me that, that tells me that 1 over d1 squared is an integer, but d1 is also an integer. So that tells me that this is plus or minus 1. And so now I know all the dimensions are 1, or plus or minus 1. And so from that, you can play around with this a little bit more. The FP dimension, so um, FP dimension must appear as a column of the S matrix up to some overall scalar. Um, and so you can use that fact and 
immediately say, well, the FP dimension of this category is three, and then by now, right, it's a pointed category. All dimensions are plus one in this case. Um, and dimension three, you've just classified it up to, right, a choice of a metric group on Z3. Okay. So, right, half a page, you can classify this one. And now, what was, so, um, what do we do? Well, you now go through all of the possible um, uh, abelian subcategories of, uh, of symmetric groups like this and consider them all in their various incarnations. And you use all the symmetry and you play around and you try to classify. This works great um, all the way up to rank four. Okay, so the rank four paper that we wrote, this. This is essentially all we use, stuff I've said so far. Okay. So maybe as an exercise, you might consider thinking about uh, what would happen if, for example, you took trivial Galois group in rank three. Okay. What would that mean? That would mean that the S matrix entries are all integers. What can happen? Is there a question? So how do you deduce from the sigma FP on the normalized column to the conclusion of the commute column? So the commute, the commute the normalized column, right? Yes. But then how do you go from there to the commuting column? To this part. No, uh, well, no. Well, all I'm saying is it permutes the normalized columns. Oh. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so it does not commute column. It no. The normalized column. No, yeah, you can see it, it sort of pops things around. Okay. The yeah, I, I thought I should know the answer, but I don't. Yeah, yeah it's good because it's not true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So then, uh, like, so you could consider, like, let's take G to be trivial. Okay. And most likely, you know, like, so we found. Oh, we actually found an example, right? So two things can happen. Either you come up, find a contradiction. Right? So there's some, something breaks, and you say, okay, that Galois group doesn't work, and you continue. Otherwise, right, you have to, you know, you sort of do what you can, you solve, and then you have S and T maybe, you know exactly what they are, um, but then you're like, well, is there a realization of this thing? And so now you have to go back to the first talk and try to find some category that realizes this modular data. Otherwise, you don't know if it exists or not. And in fact, there are modular data out there that people have written down that satisfy a bunch of things. And it's sort of not known if there's a category that, it, that exists. So um, anyway, so that, that gives more people more jobs. It's good. OK, so that's one way of doing this. Now, let's think um, a little bit about how we can use this representation theory instead. So this is a little bit trickier. But um, we know that this representation factors over SL2 Z mod n. And so um, moreover, you can, um, you can bound n in terms of the rank. That's not too hard to do. Um, you use the Galois theory to do that. And so, like, if you're trying to study rank six, let's say, then there's some pretty explicit bound on what n can be. Okay? And so then, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to look at representations of, you know, SL2 Z mod n for small n. Now, that sounds like it's kind of a pain. And indeed, it would be if it weren't for the Chinese remainder theorem, which says that SL2 Z mod n factors as a direct product of groups of the form SL2 Z mod a power of a prime. Okay, so it just factors. So that's a really nice fact. So now you can focus on just those prime powers. And so if you have a representation of SL2 Z mod n, right, then, um, well, by restriction, you get representations of these various factors. And so the, the actual representation, when you decompose it, will be just right, sort of built from these representations of 
SL2Z mod prime powers. So that's very useful. So you can sort of decompose, and so I was meant to write something now. Um, so you kind of decompose this, this so the image of, um, of S and, and, um, and T um, into kind of um, direct sums of you know, rho i of S, uh, rho i of T, and sort of study those pieces. So now it turns out that low dimensional representations of SL2 Z mod N are classified, so low, low rank. And so we can actually just try to build these things from the ground up. So, uh, right. Um, yeah, so you start with some matrix. Now, something interesting um, you can actually write any. Uh, representation of one of these groups in a nice form. You can always write it so that T is diagonal. The image of T is diagonal. And the image of S is symmetric. Okay? It's always possible to do this. And so you can sort of write an S hat and a T hat as being you know, the matrices sort of S and T but in a different basis. And now, of course, the basis, that's a tricky thing. But we know that our actual S and T matrices also have the property that T is diagonal and S is symmetric. And so what you look for, so you kind of just build these in chunks. And you look for uh, a matrix, say, an F, so that when you conjugate this S hat, uh, you get sort of the S matrix, or rather S tilde matrix, which maybe I didn't carefully point out where that was. Uh, here, okay. Right here, it's these S and T's, the one that give you an actual representation, okay. So that representation is supposed to be equivalent to this one, so there's some conjugation. And you might be surprised to learn that you can always assume that it's orthogonal. Shouldn't be super surprising. If you have a symmetric matrix, if you have a symmetric matrix, then um, and you conjugate by an orthogonal matrix, then it remains symmetric. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, uh, and in fact, so these pieces are also, uh, uh, the, these pieces are irreducible, and so you really can just like go through and do it using gap or something like this. Okay, okay. right. Now, here's the other thing. You may as well assume that this um, matrix that you're using to conjugate this, this S and T matrix over to S tilde and T tilde, you actually might as well assume that it commutes with T hat, okay? Because, uh, right, it's diagonal, and so that's, that's like a choice you can make. Because you can always permute things later. That's a perfectly good um, orthogonal matrix, okay? So you can do that. And then what do you do? Well, you, you sort of do this, and you get yourself some candidate matrices, S tilde, T tilde. And then you start seeing, do these satisfy all of the conditions? And most of the time, the answer is no, and you stop. Okay. So it, this, um, this is sort of an idea we thought about a long time ago. And we thought it was completely infeasible. But recently, in work with Richard Ng and Xiaogang Wen, and Zheng Han, um, we've realized that you really can organize this in quite a reasonable way. Yeah? So, it's, it's hard to see, or it's easy to see that you can make a set of all the stuff. So, so how are you doing for this? Right. Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's not too bad. It's, it's just like some matrix analysis. You kind of write it as a product of you know, something that is 
orthogonal and then something else, and then you see that something else is something you can get rid of. So, yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's a calculation. Yeah, it's not too bad. Right, so in fact, this is, uh, so when I, um, the point is I'm going to decompose it into irreducible pieces. But really what I'm going to do is I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to start with the irreducible pieces. And that's what this S hat is. It's a block diagonal matrix, right? And each of these is sort of the, the irreducible block corresponding to S, yeah, image of S. And then T is, right, is, also, is diagonal, so we don't have to worry about that. Okay, now, of course, so the point is we can simply write down this S hat, a bunch of choices, and then you're kind of looking for F. And F has a bunch of variables in it. But there's one really saving grace here, and that is that um, the entries of the T matrix um, have some very nice overlapping condition. Okay, and I'll, I'll actually point that out. So this is the key here, and I'll provide a proof. So if you have a representation coming from a modular category, and your um, modular representation splits into a direct sum of two non-trivial representations, then if you look at the eigenvalues of the T matrix, the image of the T matrix under these two uh, representations, they have to overlap. Okay. It's guaranteed that they will overlap. And so the way to prove this is, well, if you just look at it and say, okay, here I've written, I've written this as this direct sum, so here's my T, and here's my S. Okay. Now, I've claimed, and it's not hard to see, that you can assume that your matrix F, or whatever in this case I'm calling it U, actually commutes with T, okay? So this condition here. But if it commutes with T, then it, it, it had better have, uh, yeah, um, right, this kind of block structure by the fact that, uh, by sort of this fact. So I guess I'm, I'm sort of giving a proof by contradiction. So let me back up. So suppose it decomposes in this way, and yet the spectra have empty intersections. If the spectra have empty intersection, then this U matrix here had better not move things from one side to the other, right? Because, well, it's supposed to commute. It's, it's screwing things up. And so that means that U has to have itself have a block structure, okay? If U has this block structure, then when we try to construct S tilde, right, which is using the same U, it's the same transformation, then that matrix will have block structure. But that means that you've got a whole lot of zeros in the first column or first row. And that can't happen. You can't have zero quantum dimension. Okay. So this is a proof of this fact that um, if it decomposes into a direct sum, then the, the corresponding T spectra must have some intersection. Okay. And so that's where all of the interesting things happen. So if, for example, it's irreducible, right, so it doesn't decompose in this way, then in particular you can conclude, um, right, that, um, that sort of, well, you, you can just sort of use the, rep the, the irreducible representations. Um, so let me, I'll, I'll actually go through that, but maybe I'll stop here and see if there's any, any questions about this short proof. Pretty useful. Um, so it, it, I can't rule it out. Um, I can't think of a, a particular example, but yeah, that could well be. Um, Yes, yeah, so she's wondering if is, is it possible for rho to be rho 1 plus rho 1? Yeah. 
Um, certainly, I can imagine in higher rank that you know things will repeat, but I don't, I don't know of any examples where this this happens. Yeah, because then the spectra would really overlap. Yeah. Okay, so here I present for you the low-dimensional irreducible representations at finite level. So the level is just the order of the T matrix. That's all you need. Okay. So um, one-dimensional representations, in other words, a character of SL2Z, uh, will be just given by the T matrix is some 12th root of unity, and the S matrix is some 4th root of unity, possibly not primitive root of unity. And they're related in some way. So those are pretty easy. So those are the one-dimensional representations. So now you can go classify rank one or modular categories using this. Um, right. Um, OK, yeah, but so also notice we have, so, um, and the reason I'm presenting these is you'll notice that they're always, the way we've written them, we've actually written them to be symmetric, right? Some other basis choice would give you something not symmetric, but you can write them as something symmetric. And, um, right, so these are all of them that are of prime power level. Okay. Of course, I can get another representation of dimension two by tensoring with, say, a character. Right, so I could easily get, so this has level five, I could tensor with something, um, you know, a 12th root of unity and get something where the level is uh, 60, right, it's possible. Um, but prime powers are all that really matters. And I've given you the degree, uh, the dimension two and the dimension three ones here. And so the, the T matrix is always diagonal. This parity is not something you have to worry too much about, but it has something to do with self-duality or non-self-duality. It just has to do with um, whether or not um, S squared uh, is the identity. If S squared is the identity, it's even. If it's sort of not, then it's odd. And that only is something that you can talk about, really, for uh, irreducible representation. So you could have a sum of something that's odd and even. So, um, you have to be a bit careful. Okay, but anyway, you can start looking here and maybe recognize a few um, matrices that look like they could be S matrices, right? So like, uh, like, I don't know, maybe here, you may have encountered this S matrix before, right? This is for semion, right? And um, well, this is the golden mean, so you might guess there's some Fibonacci happening here. Um, uh, yeah, anything else? Does this look familiar? Yeah, okay. The easing. Of course, it's in the wrong basis, right? It's permuted a bit, but okay. Um, right, so anyway, we have these. So if you wanted, so at this point, you could um, use this information to try to classify all modular categories of rank three or less, just from what I've written on this page, because it's either irreducible, dimension three, or it's a direct sum of you know, a two and a one. It could be a direct sum of three ones, um, uh, one dimensionals. And you could just sort of put them together and have at it, see what happens. So um, right. So why don't we do the following? Um, why don't we do uh, rank two? Okay. So let's try to classify rank two after the question. Yeah. Can you have some representation that aren't? Yeah, so you'll see that, no, no. Uh, many times you find there's a problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, so usually that's what we're doing is eliminating the possibility. Yeah. So, right, so let's think about rank two for a moment. Um, so, right, so we would only need things on the left hand side here. And, um, right, so let's. Uh, do this exercise, fill in the details is the exercise. So the first thing to um, observe is that if it's rank two, it can't be the direct sum of two one-dimensionals. Okay, anybody think of a reason why? Yeah, rank is the number of simple objects. And so in this case, yeah, so it's like, 
So, yeah. Think of something? Yeah. Because if you have like two rank ones and it's just two simple, two trivial objects? Um, it's something like that. So here, here's maybe the, the hint. If I take a, a direct sum of two one-dimensional representations, what kind of image does that representation have? Well, it's abelian, right? So one-dimensional representation has abelian image, so you have, so that says the S and T commute, and well, now you're screwed, right? This isn't gonna happen, right? You, you tri yeah, you'll get zeros, and yeah, there won't be any way. Uh, possibly. Um, yeah, yeah, it's so, it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, it isn't quite symmetric, but it, it just wouldn't exist because your S matrix would be a diagonal matrix and your T matrix would be a diagonal matrix. There would be no way to sort of undo this, right? And so you'd have zeros lying around. There's probably lots of ways of, of finding a contradiction. So the T matrix is identical, right? Well, it could be two different one-dimensional. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, so the T is the identity. Yep. Right? Uh, right, but yeah, but then um, it, it can't quite be anything because the, the entries have to live in the field generated by the entries of the T matrix. So that's kind of a problem. Yeah, anyway, there's lots, there's lots of ways to, to see that this would cause problems. But, but that's sort of step one, is say, OK, it actually had better be a two-dimensional irreducible that we're looking at. OK, so now we're going to look at all the two-dimensional irreducibles. Okay? And now the thing to think about is that, um, let's go back to this page. So what this is saying is that our S matrix like the actual S matrix of the category, looks like one of these five things up to permuting the columns and rows simultaneously, and maybe some scalar multiplication by something. Okay? And so if you start looking at these, what you'll notice is that, well, um, at least in magnitude, the dimension of the category, remember when we, to get these matrices from our S matrix, we had to divide by the square root of the dimension of the category to get to these. So that immediately tells us that, look, like the diagonal entries, the magnitudes of those must be, one of those must be one over square root of the dimension of the category in magnitude. Okay? And so, well, you can just look at them and you can now immediately say, okay, it's, uh, so the, the first one, if it were the first one, it would be dimension four, right? It's the square of, uh, it's one over the square of one half. So that would be dimension four. And this one here would give you dimension three. This one here, you probably scratch your head a bit and try to figure out what that is, but it's, it's Fibonacci, th something new with Fibonacci. Here, this would be dimension two. Okay? So you can simply write down from the get-go what the dimensions could possibly be. So they could be four, three, this kind of weird-looking number squared, or um, a Galois conjugate of that weird number squared, or two. Okay? That's simply from looking at the diagonal entries of these matrices and looking at their, ma their modulus, their, their magnitude. Okay? Because to get these from S, you divide by square root of dimension. That's all. Okay? And then there's some, maybe some scalars, but those scalars are roots of unity, so they don't bother us. Okay? And so then, you think about these and you write down what's happening. And the first case, well, if you just look at what that matrix must be, it's, it's, so this is the dimension formula. It says four, the dimension, is equal to one plus square root of three squared. But remember I said the square of the dimension of any simple object has to divide the dimension of the, um, of the category. And so that would say that four must be divisible by three, and that's not true. Similarly, for this three case, you look at the matrices and you see that this is the dimension equation. 
and 2 doesn't divide 3, so that's no good. Um, this one, it turns out, if you look at it, it it's possible. That's the Fibonacci theory. Uh, the other one will be the yang Li theory, so the Galois conjugate of the Fibonacci theory. And the case where it's dimension 2, you get semion. Okay? And so we have realizations. So just from this technique, we can classify rank 2 modular categories. Uh, quickly. Okay, any questions? Yeah? In your previous slide, um, why was the level 3 on the left column, why does the numerator have a negative 5? Yeah, it's just so that it's an honest representation of, of this thing. So. Notice the order of the T matrix is definitely 3, right? So I could get rid of that I by multiplying the S by I, but then I would have to compensate the T and multiply by something, and uh, it, would, it would make it so that it wouldn't be level 3 anymore. So is it not 1 over the quantum dimension of the category? Would that make it? Yeah, so th it isn't quite. So this is, just, this is just the representation, the honest representation. Yeah. Um, you're right that you would probably rescale these things, but in order to present these as prime power levels, you have to do this this way. But you're absolutely right. It, you, know, you would have to multiply through by something to get rid of that I because that's sort of, the S matrix doesn't have a, you know, an I in front of it. Question? Uh, on the point you were uh, relating the Fibonacci to, uh, to some of the theory you're using uh, uh, a Galois uh, complication. Uh -huh. So, say you have uh, a valid you know, ca category with all the restrictions in one. Is there always a way to use Galois complication to produce another one? So, you can produce that as a test matrix, of course. Yeah. So, it is, it is a theorem that if you have a modular category, and you apply a Galois conjugation to all of the entries, you will get another modular category. And you have to be a little bit careful because F isn't involved here. But it's a theorem of Zheng Han and his student and someone else that, um, that in fact, the entries of the F matrix can be put into a field in such a way so that you can uh, do Galois theory, apply these things. Um, but yeah, it is, it is true that the Galois conjugate of any modular data is, again, a valid modular data, and in fact, realizable. Yeah. OK, good. So how are we doing on time? Maybe we should look along here. OK, so that, we did that exercise. Um, so now we can actually all present what the current results are. So we have a complete classification up to fusion rules, or really up to modular data for modular categories of rank up to six. Okay? And so I've sort of written down a represent, representative of each sort of fusion rule class. Question? What, what do you mean up to modular data? What does it mean? Right. So um, we can write down all possible modular data um, of uh, modular categories up to rank six. and um, so uh, we, the point is we can't actually classify, we can't decide because of what Colleen will tell us soon. We can't say that the modular data determines the category. But we do know, so for every, for every modular data, we know there exists a category with that modular data. And so that's, that's what I mean. Okay, I didn't so you, you, was, you list out candidates like uh, this, all, all candidate modular data that can correspond to some other k. Yes. But you don't know for sure if there are actually k here. No, we know that they all uh, exist. Yeah. For the data. Yes, for a given modular data in theory and in practice. <laughs> it could happen, yeah. Um, but what I've written here is just a representative of, so an example that has those fusion rules. Okay. So that's an interesting question, and maybe we'll get to it in a moment, um, about like, what more can you say. But notice quite, 
you know, all of them somehow seem to come from quantum groups. And maybe I haven't explained this notation very well, but um, I sort of explaining it here as best I can. But the point is, right, so here this is the Fibonacci theory or something related to it. Um, uh, this is a, the semion, and you just kind of continue. Um, an interesting one is right here, PSO5 level 3 halves. So that's a weird category that has no unitary realization, but it is modular. Um, and that, anyway, that's the construction that I know of uh, is, is this kind of construction. Yeah? I think it's I think it's just rank six, but yeah, maybe you're right. Let me think about that. No, I think it's okay. I think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Level three. Yeah, I think it's just six. Yeah. Um, and then of course you can take products when the rank is uh, not prime. Products will also work. Deline products still modular, so that works. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you can see here G2 shows up, and you get SO eventually at this level. So it's kind of interesting stuff. Um, uh, in rank two? Yeah, so, no, so what we did is we did a rank three, and we proved that. So when, the first thing we did was this one. The one we just did, we found that only two of them work Really, there were three of them, but one of them was Galois conjugate, the Yang Li, which has the same fusion rules as Fibonacci. So that's why it's not listed. Yeah. Yeah. Eric? Yep. What happened to G2 level two? G2 level two? Yeah. It should be on the base somewhere, but I don't know where it goes. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it has the same fusion rules as one of these. That's. Yeah, that's <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is its rank? And I'll take, I mean, so. What? Yeah. yeah, I should have no idea. So, in this table, I get that our Q, when you have a point of the it extends far all possible. Yeah. So That's that right. That, that, uh, That's right. Yeah. And again, it's, I'm just taking a representative of fusion rules. So, they'll all have the same fusion rules. They won't depend on Q. Huh? But different oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the table I'm giving is only, represent, is only up to fusion rules. We have a classification up to modular data. That's the, the statement. Right. Um, yeah. So anyway, so this is, this is the state of the art at the moment. Um, and yeah, so lots of applying all of these things. So um, now a, a, a question that maybe you, one should have answered before trying to classify things is, to find out if it's even feasible. But, um, right, so Wang, in fact, conjectured that um, there are finitely many modular categories of any fixed rank. And we certainly saw that up to rank six, right? Um, but why should this be? Well, so we, and so we finally proved um, that this conjecture is true. So I thought just for fun, I would give an outline of this proof. Um, kind of how, how the structure goes. So the first thing is that the order of t is bounded in terms of uh, the rank. That's the first step. Now, it's not hard to prove that uh, if you have a bound on the dimension of the category, you get a bound on the nijk, okay? Because there's some eigenvalue re relationship. And so that it's enough to just bound the dimension. We can bound the dimension in terms of the rank we're in business. Now the Cauchy theorem, we apply that, and that tells us that we can at least say something about the prime divisors of this dimension, and there's only finitely many possible prime divisors because n is bounded. Okay, and um, so that, that's sort of the, an important step. Then we use this equation, the dimension equation. The dimension of C is the sum of the squares of the dimensions of the simple objects. Uh, divide through by dimension of C to get um, an equation that um, looks a bit more sort of number theory in some way. Uh, it turns out that these um, 
these elements, these uh, summands, are so-called S units, which just means that if you take the ideal they generate and factor it into it, the sort of the numerator and denominator into fractional ideals, then the only primes that can show up are primes from this finite set of so-called S units, which are the, uh, the prime divisors or the, pri the primes in uh, dividing the ideal generator by N. So lots of number theory going on here. But there's an um, interesting result from 84, which says that this equation, if you restrict to some finite set of prime divisors, sort of, uh, there's only finitely many solutions if you're careful. Okay? And we're careful. Works out. And so there, what this says is that, well, if there's finitely many solutions to this equation for a fixed R, then in particular, right, the dimension is bounded. Take the biggest one, it's a finite set, it's a bounded number. So now you've got finite choices for the dimension, hence bounded, and that then proves uh, rank finiteness. Okay. okay. Right, so anyway, so this was, in, in, but it's kind of a, a nice, story that in the sense that um, right, this is kind of what we wanted to prove, but um, absent a proof, we just tried to classify things. And as we tried to classify things, we developed techniques. And those techniques eventually led to a proof. So um, it's kind of the, I don't know, the frog versus bird kind of uh, idea. We just worked really hard in the mud until we found a solution rather than having some kind of higher perspective that made everything clear. So here's a few miscellaneous results that I thought I would just mention, um, uh, sort of classification results. So you can play around with different pieces of this picture. So if the order of t is uh, 2, 3, 4, or 6, or if the fp dimension of the category is an odd number, then the category itself is integral. The dimensions of the simple objects are actually integers, not just, not just that their squares are integers. So like if you think of easing category, this has uh, right, dimension 4, and you have objects of dimension the square root of 2. So that's right. But 4 is not odd, right? so it's OK. Um, right, so anyway, but th this is the point that you can do this. And so then you might ask, OK, let's try to classify those things odd dimensional, or um, order of t being one of these. And in fact, you can, um, and we did, give a, at least a characterization of modular categories um, with t matrix of order 2, 3, 4, or 6. Um, they are simply, well, they are modular categories that sit inside the representation category of this, of some uh, twisted double of a finite group, G where the exponent of g is 2, 3, 4, or 6, okay, or corresponding. That's roughly how this works. So in particular, these are all group theoretical. And so that gives a really solid characterization of these things. Um, uh, recently, there was a paper that came out by um, Zensky and Plavnik. I probably pronounced that wrong. What is it? Zanky. Zanky and Plavnik. Um, so, uh, Right, where they, they um, were able to show something rather interesting, that if you, so if you, suppose you have FP dimension odd, and the rank is at most 23. Then there's two possibilities. One is um, that they're either pointed, so certainly those exist, or they're perfect. So pointed means everything's invertible. Perfect means only the trivial object is invertible. And so it's like quite a dichotomy. And in fact, the conjecture is that none of them are perfect. They're all pointed. And this is a sharp result because um, in rank 25, there is something that's not pointed or perfect. And so this is kind of a nice, uh, I mean, this is the boundary of what you can say in this sense. But the, it's led to some very nice conjectures about, um, about whether things are weakly 
group theoretical or not. So if any of these perfect categories exist, they would not be weakly group theoretical, and that would be an interesting counterexample. Um, dimension, so if we look at integral categories, or rather weakly integral categories, rank less than seven, we have a classification. Um, lots of work on the, if, you, if your dimension has some specific prime power decomposition. Um, but now let me get to the sort of elephant in the room, um, or maybe the, the Bruin that keeps showing up. Um, so an actual full classification uh, up to braided fusion category equivalence is pretty hard. Okay, So there's only a few cases where we have a classification to that level of, of detail. For some, so the problem is for some fixed fusion rules, determine all of the modular fusion categories up to equivalence with those fusion rules. It's pretty hard. It's been done for um, the fusion rules that come from SUN level K. So that's a paper of Kajdan Wenzel. Um, it's also been done for these metaplectic categories, SON level two. Other than that, I don't know of any big families where it's been done. So um, to sort of end with a um, question I think is pretty compelling. So suppose I have some modular category. I write down its fusion rules, and I want to characterize or classify all modular categories with those fusion rules. You know, is it certainly there's finitely many, but how do I get them? So here would be a question, I'm not willing to make it a conjecture, but can you get them all by either reversing braiding um, or zesting that fixed representative? And it's so far lots of cases. This the answer is is yes. But anyway, I think this would be quite a nice characterization of uh, of classes with the same fusion rules. So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.